I wanted to do a completely different video today. Um, this is a New York Times article. Convicted of sex crimes but with no victims, an online sting operation to catch child predators snared hundreds of men. What were they really guilty of? Now, right off the bat, this is an article that it's written by a Pulitzer Prize winner, so it's, uh, uh, I guess, it's a good article. Uh, but it certainly has an agenda. The, the, the writer, Michael Weinrip, clearly does not like the, he does not like these things. I love these things. I love To Catch a Predator, that show from the 2000s. Uh, it's, a, it's a great show to watch. It's an awful show to be on. Uh, for those unaware, there are, well, for the sake of this article, there are undercover police who go online and pose as, uh, teenagers, preteens, uh, with the intent of having uh, pedophiles basically contact them. The police never contact people first. They can't. Uh, they have to let the other person uh, initiate the conversation. And if things turn to sex, well, you'll just see. Jace Hamprick worked as an apprentice laborer during the week, renovating homes around Vancouver, Washington, and at a neighborhood gas station on weekends. Much of the rest of his life was online. He was a hard, he was hardcore, amassing a collection of more than 200 games. People told him it wasn't smart to be so cut off from reality, but his internet net life felt rich. As a dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons, all right, stop right there. We already know he's a loser. And, and I say this as somebody who likes Magic the Gathering, all right? He's, I feel bad saying that, but but look, I mean, he's in a story about people who get caught online trying to have sex with teenage kids, okay? He controlled other players' destinies. As a video warrior, he was known online by his nom de guerre and was constantly messaging fellow gamers, particularly his best friend, Simon. Though the two had never met in person... Okay, first of all, your best friend can't be somebody you've never actually met. I'm sorry, it just can't, all right? That's... That's like saying your prison pen pal is your best friend. It's just weird. All right, so we've already established this guy is not, he's not all there. Uh, over the last few years, they paired up as teammates playing Rainbow Siege 6 and Rocket League and grew close. At 20, Hambrick was still living at home with his mother to save money for college. I, look, that's, I'm not going to get on him for living at home at 20. Most kids are in college uh, at that age. And it's, you can't expect them to just live on their own just like that. But you know what? At 20, you're technically not a, not a kid. You are an adult. Legally, you are an adult. And that's important to remember. He was a voracious reader who could knock off a thousand page fantasy novel in two days. People liked him. He made them laugh. When he and his mother lived in places that had board games, he was a regular. And his kindness could, could be surprising. He would spend morning handing out sandwiches to the hungry. Oh, he's like Mother Teresa, except he got wrapped up in an internet sting. The problem he knew was that he was a nerd. Sometimes he was too open with people. As a boy, he took medication for ADHD. His mother, Kathleen, describes him affectionately as introverted, sensitive, immature, coddled, nerdy son. They are very close. She would prod him to go out more, but he wasn't someone who could meet women at a bar. In fairness, I'm not someone who can meet women at a bar. I, I just, I'm not. I don't have the confidence. I don't like bars that much either. Uh, so I'm not, I can't get on him for that. Online, it was different. Starting when he was 18, a few times a month, he clicked through the casual encounter section of Craigslist, looking for sex. Okay. Okay. Let's start there. I, I've been on Craigslist before. Never have I gone to the casual encounter section. I didn't even know that one existed until uh, I read this article. And now I'm going to go to Craigslist. No, I'm not. I, I mean, just, ugh, it's creepy. I'm sorry, it's just creepy. There were so many listings, but when he tried messaging, it was rare to get a response. If people did respond, they often went dark after a few emails. Users had to certify they were 18 or older, but at the time, Craigslist didn't verify users' age. Okay. People described their appearance in personal ads. He sent photos, then sent photos that didn't match. Some seemed to enjoy role-playing. Once he replied to a post describing an attractive 21-year-old, but when he arrived at the address she gave him, an old, <laughs> an old man answered the door. He got out of there fast. Every once in a while it worked. 
in the past few years, he had sex with five or six women he met this way. Ugh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is just, it's just, ugh. All right. But hey, look, whatever. On Friday after work in February 2017, Hambrick came across a casual encounters W for men, women searching for man. Post that scene meant for him. Just gamer girl sitting home on a sunny day, it read. We can chat as long as I'm not li li loving, living. I, you know, I don't know what these youngsters mean, so whatever that means. Hambrick emailed back. Sounds like fun. What game you playing? I am hooked on alien isolation, gamer girl replied. Forget sex, Hambrick wrote. Let me come watch. I haven't gotten that one yet. Adding that he was 20. 15 minutes later, 15 minutes later, gamer girl replied that she was 13. Boom. Right there. Right there. You cut off contact, okay? That's what you do. Hambrick was confused. Why did you post an ad in Craigslist if you're 13? You mean 23? Okay, maybe, maybe that's a legitimate question to ask. I don't know. Uh, I have never engaged in conversation with a teenage girl of any kind online. Some things you just don't do, unlike this guy. She asked for his cell phone number and they switched to texting, exchanging photos. Gamer Girl was beautifully thought, if he wasn't being pranked. Big eyes, cute white cap, soft smile, gazing up at the camera serenely with a really nice set of headphones. Bum, 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 bum. They exchanged a few texts about sex. Okay, whoa. All right. So this person has established that she is 13, and you're going to read down here. She claimed to be 13. You do not exchange texts about sex with a 13 year old girl. You don't do it. Okay. You cut off all contact immediately. You report them. You don't continue to talk sexually. But he was already hoping for more than just sex. I don't get out much, he texted. I feel like if we got to talking, it might go somewhere. You're a beautiful gamer. I have no problem hanging out with you. That's cool, Gamer Girl replied. What about that eaten out stuff? Yes, I still, I will still do that. Um, Okay. I don't know if the eating out stuff is, uh, all right, but whatever. Oh, my naughty boy. Okay. First of all, is this the extent of the sexual chat that these guys had? The article doesn't, doesn't claim. I mean, these, these texts, these t chats can be enormously long. Maybe this was some of the tamer stuff. I don't know. But some of these texts, these chats can be disgusting. So we don't know the full extent of the text exchange that this guy had with this supposed 13 year old girl. Uh, the photos seem to tell a different story and the gaming chair she was seated in looked too expensive for a kid. Oh, idiot, kids don't buy expensive things. Their parents buy it for them. She used slang, a 13 year old girl probably wouldn't know, like FTP, explicitive, fuck the police. Uh, you know what, kids hear things that are from the 80s, all right? Vulgarities and snide tones seemed too adult. His texts were full of uh, LOLs. Was she an immature teenager or a sly adult? Her driving direction seemed too specific for 13. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. This guy, he's a nerd and he's an idiot at the same time, okay? And, and you'll see why in a second. Hamburg texted that he would be driving a red Prius, his mother's, and Gamer Girl replied she would be wearing a gray sweatshirt with ripped jeans. It was a 20-minute drive to the house in suburban Vancouver. After stopping for condoms, he's showing intent, okay? You don't buy condoms unless you're planning at some point to have sex. This girl has said she is 13, okay? This is not some innocent kid. He's a 20-year-old man. At some point, you have to be responsible for your actions. And as we soon find out, he's going to have to take responsibility. Uh, three and a half hours after their... He arrived at 7 p.m. Three and a half hours after their first emails. Okay, so three and a half hours earlier, he meets a 13-year-old girl. They talk about sex. Three and a half hours later, he's stopping for condoms. Okay, that's what I call a fast mover. She came to the door just as she'd said, in torn jeans and gray sweatshirt, as beautiful as her photo. She didn't look 13 at all, more like she was in her 20s. You made it, she called out and waved to him to follow. Court documents would later show. When he got inside, she disappeared down a hallway. Suddenly, two police officers wearing bulletproof vests appeared from a back room, ordered him to lie on the floor and handcuffed him. What's going on? We're going to advise you. You're under arrest. Okay, why? We'll explain it in just a moment. Is it possible I could talk to my mom? That's not possible right now. 
Since 2015, nearly 300 men in cities and towns across Washington state have been arrested in online predator stings, most of them run by the state patrol and codenamed Operation Net Nanny. The men range from age 17 to 77, though about a quarter are 25 or younger. Okay, you know what? 18 to 25, you're an adult man. All right? I just want to throw that out there. You are no longer a child. As many as two dozen have been rounded up in a single sting and charged with attempted rape of a child, as Jay Sandbrick was, even though no actual children were involved. Um, well, isn't that a good thing? Is that not a good thing that there was no actual child involved? The emails and texts offering sex were written by undercover officers. The girls in the photos are not their team. They're police officers, typically the youngest women on the force. For law enforcement, stings are an efficient way to make high-profile felony arrests and secure convictions. In June 2016, John Garden, a state patrol de direct detective, emailed a fellow trooper about joining him on a sting in Spokane. If you can come play and chat some guys in, he wrote, according to the court. See if you can come play and chat some guys in, he wrote, according to a court filing. The conviction rate in cases that go to trial is about 95%. Though men don't get that far, there is such shame associated with a sex crime, let alone a child's sex crime. Well, maybe it's a good thing that shame is associated with a child's sex crime. Okay? It's one of the most heinous crimes out there. And I... I'm going to go on record. I was never molested. I've had a good upbringing, a good, a good childhood. I have an eight-year-old son. I'm very protective of him. I always tell him about stranger danger, okay? I know there are awful people out there. I was a newspaper reporter for 12 years. I have seen some of the worst people ever go through the court system in New Jersey where I worked, okay? So there should be shame associated with child sex crimes. That's not a bad thing. That a majority of the defendants plead guilty rather than face a jury. At least five of the men have committed suicide, including a 66-year-old caught in the same operation as Hambrick, who then fled to California. As the police there moved to make the arrest, the man shot himself in the head. Um, would it have been better had that man found an actual 13-year-old girl or boy and violated that kid? See, the way this article is written, it's you could tell he does not like these things. And he really minimizes, in certain circumstances, he really does minimize or just glosses over how evil and terrible some of these acts are that these men want to commit on children. Analysis of court records in Washington State stings, as well as interviews with the police and prosecutors, reveals that most of the men arrested have no felony record. And, okay, uh, that maybe that means they just haven't been caught before and they've done this before. I'm sure that's a strong possibility and probability uh, with several of these men. Strong predictor of predatory behavior is an obsession with child pornography. But at the time of their arrest, according to State Patrol, 89% have none in their possession and 92% have no history of violent crime. So what? So what? Oh, because you, do, all right, so you came to rape a 13-year-old girl or boy, but because you don't have child pornography, we'll give you a slap on the wrist. Sorry. Uh, again, this, this seeks to minimize just the heinousness of what these guys could get away with if they wanted, or if they could. They are nonetheless sentenced on average to more than six years in prison with no chance of parole, according to my analysis of the 270 arrests I was able to confirm. State police calculate the average is just over five years. Once released, the men are listed on the state sex offender registry good for at least 10 years and often for life. Almost all were caught up in Operation. All, almost all were caught up in Operation Net Nanny. Although the sting in which Hambick was arrested was a joint venture between State Patrol and the Vancouver Police. Uh, yeah, that doesn't look like a 13-year-old girl. But again, nobody forced that kid to go to that house. The kid went of his own volition. He bought condoms. That tells you what he wanted to do. The men caught in these cases can wind up serving more time than men who are convicted of sexually assaulting and raping actual children. While there are no statistics comparing sentencing among different states and, su and such predator stings, Washington's criminal code has some particularly draconian provisions that result in unusually lengthy sentences. Now, as somebody who's seen a lot of To Catch a Predator episodes, and you can find them on YouTube, Georgia and Kentucky put people away for at least four years, just like this guy, okay? Uh, my home state of New Jersey, they're lenient. They're, I, I, they're a little more lenient. 
uh, even in cases uh, that I covered when I was a reporter, I remember covering a, a case where it was a young guy. He must have been in his 20s. Uh, I think he got off with um, probation. He was in possession of child pornography and he got off with probation. I, I, I'm pretty sure he did not go to jail. So, gee, big surprise, New Jersey, whatever. Um, so it, it does depend on the state. Maybe Washington's laws uh, aren't draconian. Maybe they're in place to send a strong message to would-be pedophiles not to do it, or at least not to do it in their state. That's one way of looking at it. The legal standard for making an arrest in police things is not high. Washington law allows undercovers, undercover officers to use deception, trickery, and artifice, or artifice. They can fake sympathy or friendship. The police need only demonstrate that their target took a substantial step buying condoms toward meeting the undercover officer. Hammer's case, that step was following the officer to her house. It can also be stopping to buy condoms, which he did, or even just parking near the sting house. Okay, I can't get, I, I, I can't let go of the fact that the kid bought condoms. That means he wanted to have sex. He was going to a 13-year-old girl's house, or who he thought to be 13. Jurors who serve in net nanny cases often express surprise that the defense doesn't argue entrapment. In fact, an entrapment defense is almost never successful in sting cases, according to Jessica Roth, a professor of criminal law at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law in New York. Most criminal trials, prosecutors present their version of events. The defense lawyer take, tries to poke enough holes in the account to produce reasonable doubt in jurors' minds. But entrapment is a, an affirmative defense that effectively requires the defendant to admit wrongdoing. Yes, I wrote this text that talked about having sex with a 13-year-old. While at some point, while at the same time arguing that he was manipulated by police into doing something he wouldn't normally do, engage in talking about having sex with a 13-year-old. In entrapment cases, the accused often the accused often take the stand to give their side of the story, which rarely works in their favor. Even the most law-abiding person subject to cross-examinations can look unreliable, Roth says. Of the nearly 300 Washington state sting arrests, I was able to find only one case in which an appeals court threw out the charges on grounds of entrapment. The state patrol uh, point to the conviction rate as confirmation of net any success. Those numbers indicate a well-run operation that is legally and structurally sound and very effective in apprehending and, pro and prosecuting those intent on causing harm to children. The online stings have had widespread and positive media coverage throughout the state. News conferences are well attended. News releases are printed verbatim, particularly by small town papers. Uh -huh, the yokels like it. That's what the New York Times is saying, you know, looking down upon the small town papers. A K O M O news story said the man faced child rape charges, though the charge was actually attempted child rape. Okay, now he, now the writer is just being a little bit nitpicky. You can easily construe that into child rape charges. Okay, I, I would have been would it be more accurate if they said the men faced attempted child rape charges? Yes, of course. But you know what? <laughs> Deal with it. A headline in the Lakewood Patch read: "22 child sex predators nabbed." Washington State Patrol news release described these men arrested as dangerous sexual predators, though they have yet to be convicted of a sex crime. Ah, uh, okay. Technically true, but, you know, the way American journalism works, we use headlights like that all the time. Uh, I think it's okay to call these guys sex predators. Statistics provided by the state police can also be misleading, creating the impression that hundreds of children were on the verge of being raped. When the police say half these cases of arrested men involve children 11 year years of age or younger, the reality is that half the fictional children in the scenarios written by the police were 11 or younger. Again, what does this, would this writer prefer that uh, police find a bunch of 11 and 10 year old children and instruct them to, to communicate with men who would like to have sex with them? Is that what this writer would prefer? Because that's insane. That's never going to happen. That's why these things are set up. You don't want to put real children in danger. The December 2015 email to his supporters, state police captain Roger Wilbur wrote why they should do more stings. Plea bargains start at 10 years in prison. Compared to other criminal cases that can take a year or longer, uh, may result in a few years in prison, cost hundreds of man hours, and still only result in a single arrest. This is a significant return on investment. Mathematically, it costs only $2,500 per, per arrest during this operation. Considering the high level of potential offense, there is a meager investment that pays huge dividends. Yes, 
Most men caught in these raids pose low risk to the public, according to Dr. Richard Packard, a past president of the Washington State Chapter of the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, and Dr. Michael O'Connell, a member of the state's Sex Offender Policy Board, who have examined about three dozen men arrested in cyber stings around the state. They say that relatively few, maybe 15% of the men they saw, pose a moderate to high risk. Hmm. Okay, so are these stings not doing some good then if they are weeding, weeding out at least 15% of the men captured who do pose a risk to society? Many have addiction problems, suffer from depression or anxiety, are artistic, or as Connell described them to me, simply pathetic, lonely people. I don't care if they are, it's still not an excuse, okay? You can be pathetic, lonely, and look for a pathetic and lonely 45-year-old woman if you're 45. I'm not 45 yet. I am lonely, but I don't consider myself pathetic. He went on, some are in marriages where things aren't going great. So what, okay? You still don't have sex with a child. They're socially inept. But this is the way of having sex and having a relationship. Yeah. They're just stupid and making not very well thought out decisions. They weren't looking for kids. But there was this one ad that caught their attention. Okay, I'm sorry, some of them were looking for kids. Absolutely, some were looking for kids. They're not going to come right out and say, some of them who can't help themselves will say that, will admit that, yes, they were. What are they going to say? Oh, yeah, I went on there deliberately looking for a 13-year-old girl. They're not going to say that. And a sizable percentage of those arrested are themselves in their late teens or early 20s and may, according to current scientific research, exercise poor judgment because the region of the brain that control risk-taking are not yet fully developed. Okay, uh, I was once in my late teens and early 20s, and you know what I never did? I never communicated with a teenager. Okay, that's creepy. You're not even friends. Like, if you're a, an 18-year-old senior in high school, are you really friends with a 13-year-old girl in high school, too? No, you're not. It's just weird, okay? You have friends your own age, maybe a couple of years younger. During his 40-year career, Packard has, has worked for both prosecutors and defense lawyers. His testimony was instrumental in preventing the release of Robert Loth, or Lau, I don't know how it's pronounced, convicted of strangling and raping a woman, stabbing her a dozen times in the vagina, and leaving her for dead. He has also done an evaluation of Joseph Nissenson, who murdered three girls and is now on death row. Packard is, in short, well acquainted with the human capacity for evil. But that is not what he says he sees the, uh, in most net nanny cases. The vast majority don't need to be in prison to keep society safe. Perhaps, but you know why they need to be in prison? To send a message to the surrounding society that police are aware that you are out there we're going to do what we can to stop you from destroying a child's life, okay? Is a child's life any less valuable if somebody who doesn't have any convictions rapes her compared to a convicted sex offender raping the same child? No, it's still the same child that has been violated. In a national study from 2017, 87% of 334 men convicted in such sins had no record of prior, concurrent, or subsequent convictions. Con convictions. Good! Maybe this scared the hell out of them never to do it again. Data in line with Packard and O'Connell's estimates. Currently, about 150 men convicted in Washington State stings are still incarcerated. If psychologist estimates are correct, as many as 125 of them may not be sexual deviants and pose a low risk to the community. Some caught in stings are violent predators. Take Curtis Pouncey, 60, whose history of brutal sex crimes included raping a 13-year-old girl he picked up from a bus station, as well as a 19-year-old at knife point. In August 2018, 2018 after a long term of civil commitment, Pouncey was released under supervision and just six months later arrested in a net nanny sting for attempted rape of a child. Okay. So let's just say he was caught in the same exact kind of sting, not the same exact sting, but the type of sting that the lead subject of this article was stopped in. I am glad they hold the I am glad they hold these stings. He's now serving life in prison. The law, however, doesn't distinguish between the truly truly dangerous and tr and the low risk. Without alternative sentencing, which might be a mix of community supervision by a parole officer, mandated therapy, a short jail term, and in some cases waiving the registry requirement, there is no middle ground. Okay, 
And this does get into where where is that problem solved in the legislature? Okay, the the, the judges have to sentence by what the law allows. And in this case, according to the writer, Washington states don't allow the wiggle room. In April, as COVID-19 spread through the nation's prisons, Washington's governor, Jay Inslee, granted early release to some 1,100 inmates. Anyone convicted of a violent crime or sex offense, however, including the men doing time in the net nanny cases, did not qualify. Oh, well. After Jay Sandbrook was arrested, the police checked his criminal history. He had none. He gave them permission to examine his phone for child porn. They found none. Good. That That's a good thing, okay? You can still be a pervert and not be into that kind of disgusting filth. He consented to a search of his vehicle. That didn't turn up anything evil either. He waived his Miranda rights and answered all their questions. Well, he shouldn't have done that. He should have gotten a lawyer, and perhaps that would have helped him out a little bit more. But look, he did what he did. They asked how often he masturbated and what he thought of what and what he thought of when he did, what his fetishes were, and what type of woman he preferred. My type is tall, redheaded, sophisticated, educated, bookworm glasses, he answered. Outdoorsy, but not, you know, too outdoorsy. Uh-huh. They pressed him on why he wanted to have sex with a 13-year-old. He answered repeatedly that he didn't believe she was 13. So, sorry, that's not an excuse. She said she was 13, okay? Even if, as it says, her picture didn't look like she was 13. Doesn't matter. She said she was 13. You don't go. You cut off contact. He thought she might be a grown woman engaging in role-playing. People on lie and all, lie all the time. So he, want, he so he went to see for himself. That is that is a common excuse that a lot of these predators will use. Oh, I just wanted to see if it was real. That's that's what they say after they get caught. When a woman appeared to be in her 20s up on the door, he followed her inside for sex. Still, she identified herself as being 13, and he went into the house. I do not believe that you came here to verify if this girl was 21, the, de the detective said. You couldn't help yourself. Exactly, he couldn't. He bought condoms. If she was 13, I was going to turn around and walk away. She said she was 13. You should have turned around and walked away. Okay, you're an adult. You're a grown man. Okay, having... I, I don't even want to get into it. After the arrest, he lost both of, both of his jobs. During the 15 months he awaited trial, he rarely left the house. It was all but impossible to explain to people what had happened. Yeah, probably. In May 2018, he had a bench trial and took his stand on his own behalf. Among the witnesses were undercover police for the Vancouver Police Department. Detective Robert Givens, a middle-aged man, testified that he had written all of the gamer girl emails and texts. Officer Heather Janish, dressed in her police uniform, told the court that she had posed for the photo and invited Hambrick into the house. At the time of the photo, she testified she was about 24, four years older than Hambrick. Hambrick and his mother were so confident that he would be acquitted that the two celebrated over coffee during a court recess. Well, that's just stupid. When the judge announced the verdict, they were numb. Guilty on both counts, attempted rape of a child in the second degree, and communication with a minor for immoral purposes. Based on the emails and texts, the judge found the defendant clearly expressed by words and conduct that he intended to have sex with a 13-year-old. Yes, exactly. He bought the condoms. I'd like to remind the writer, I, you know, I bet you the writer of this article wishes, wishes to God that the kid didn't buy the condoms. Hambrick's first thought was, he's joking. For the first time, it really dawned on me. I was going to prison, he later said. I looked around and I saw my Aunt Marine crying and my Aunt Sally crying. I saw my mom crying and I just broke. Before being led away, he was permitted to give his mother a hug. She rubbed his back as if he were a little boy, a man-child, their sobs filling the courtroom. He was transported to the Clark County Jail strip search and dressed in an orange jumpsuit. Sat in the corner of the cell, knees to my chest, hugging them, and I couldn't stop crying. I can't blame him for that. I've never been to jail. I've never been arrested. It's got to be pretty scary. The judge later sentenced him to 18 months to life and a minimum of 10 years on the sex offender registry. Under Washington law, the parole board has the option of extending the incarceration of offenders like Net Nandy de defendants indefinitely. Within weeks, Catherine Hambrick, now 55, rented her house and purchased an RV, which she paid uh, a family to keep parked in their backyard, minutes from the correction center in Shelton. She's fiercely protective of her son and rarely missed a visiting day. Look, she's being a good mom. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blame the mother for this. Uh, <sighs> I chose to have Jace. I was 30. I wasn't married. I didn't have a boyfriend, so I picked a man to father a child. Okay. Kathleen made a career as a computer programmer, a job she has been doing for 35 years and can do from the RV. She has been married and divorced three times. My advice, if you're ever married and divorced once, don't ever get married again. 
Uh, I, I'm just sticking to that. Mother and son traveled to, together to Morocco, Central America, Mexico, and all over Europe. Though not religious, she preached kindness. After Jason's trial, Kathleen started a blog she calls Lady Justice Myth, writing about the unfairness of the legal system, linking to court cases and news stories. Many of her blog entries rant against the prosecutor and the police. Others beg, please do not ruin my son's life with a re lifelong registration and prison. After more than two years, the blog had 141 followers. Well, my YouTube channel has been around for a year, and I think I have like 45, so you know I can't make fun of her for having low numbers. The only voice for change has come from a small band of middle and upper middle class parents of young men arrested in that nanny's things. They share legal information and attend the trials to one another's sons. Kathleen Hambrick met Dan Wright on a Florida website dedicated to challenging the state sex offender laws. I want you all to, right now, maybe I'll even try to link to it, uh, in YouTube, search for Sheriff Grady Judd in Florida, and you will find videos of him describing these kinds of things that they do in Florida and describing the type of people that they catch. He holds up the mug shots. He describes what they wanted to do when they got there. All right. This kind of gives a nice smiley face to a lot of these guys. Uh, Grady Judd will tell you exactly what these guys did, what they wrote, and what they wanted to do with the kids had they been real. Wright, an engineer, and his wife, uh, Joy Lynn, nurse, are one of at least six families of young soldiers stationed at the Joint Base Lewis and McCord near Tacoma who are arrested in the stings. Oh boy, all face discharge from the military and years in prison. Yeah, just because you're in the army, you don't you don't get a get out of jail to rape a 13 year old card. The right son, Ezra, was a 20 year old army private when he was caught in a sting in 2016. Ezra is a good person, but he's not a leader, his father told me. The military needs people who are good at following. Wright followed the undercover detective's text to the Sting House in January 2019 and was convicted of attempted first-degree rape of a child. Okay, well, what this, let me, let me just scroll down. That's his parents. What we, what this doesn't say is, what did they talk about? Okay, what did Ezra and whoever it was he was texting with, did they talk about sex at all? I, I would like to find out what he discussed with this kid or the supposed kid. This just glosses over, maybe Ezra seems like a good person, but if he is typing that he wants to do certain things to a 13-year-old child, that's not very good. Signing a clean record of military service, his lawyer asked the judge to grant him an alternative sentence that could have included suspending a prison term in favor of probation. In Washington, there are several criteria to qualify for an alternative sentence, and Wright easily met four. He had no previous conviction for a sex crime, no previous conviction for a violent crime. The offense did not result in substantial body, bodily harm, in this case, no bodily harm. He qualified for a sentence under 11 years. The stumbling block? To be eligible, eligible for alternative sentence, defendants must also have an established relationship with or a connection to the victim. Unfortunately for Wright, there was no victim in this case, or in any of these cases. In Washington, a man could be caught fondling his niece and potentially qualify for an alternative sentence. But if he sends new text to an undercover cover detective, he does not. Okay, then that's a problem with this legislature. Change the law in the legislature, get the governor to sign it, problem solved. I, I don't think that that is an unreasonable um, criteria to get probation. Uh, I do agree. I mean, it, it, it's obvious. All of these predators are not the exact same. Some are terrible, devious monsters. Others are these pathetic losers. Still, you cannot overlook the fact that they all wanted to do the same thing to a degree, have sex with a child. You, you can't get away from that. Okay, where were we? Um, the judge in Wright's case noted that while the law might be problematic, it was set up by the legislature, it was up to the legislature to change it. Good. The alternative sentencing law was last amended in 2009, long before Operation Net Nanny. One high-ranking state prosecutor told me that it might well be that if it was brought, it told me that it might well be that if it was brought to the attention of the legislature now, they might do something about it. Corrine Schempf, a county prosecutor in Tacoma, sees it differently. She says people who are willing to victimize children unknown to them are more of a danger to the community than those who victimize children they know. I, I don't know what to say about that. That's an opinion. I don't know if it's backed up by research. The Wrights are conservative religious people. So what? Their pastor sat with them for part of the trial. While, they, while the jury deliberated, mother, father, and son waited at a nearby park. We hugged Ezra before we went back in, his father wrote in a note to himself, and prayed for strength. The jury found him guilty. Ezra was sentenced to 50 months to life. 
that's like a four-year turn and will spend a minimum of 10 years on their registry. After his son's arrest, Wright scoured the internet for court records, building an Excel sheet that documents most of the nearly 300 Washington State sting cases. Wright was the first of the parents to figure out how long an average prison sentence was. The story of how Washington toughened its body of, of laws targeting sex offenders goes back more than 30 years to a man named Earl Schreiner and an appalling crime. Schreiner had an IQ in the 60s, and from a young age, he exhibited, uh, exhibited the earmarks of, viol of a violent sadist. When he was 16, the, the state declared him a defective delinquent. After he choked a 7-year-old girl and led authorities to the body of a 15-year-old girl who disappeared months earlier and had been tied to a tree, 77, Schreiner was convicted of kidnapping and assaulting a teenage girls and sentenced to 10 years in prison. He once told a cellmate, according to an account in the LA Times, that he had fantasized about customizing a van with cages so he could pick up children and molest and kill them. 1987, having served his entire sentence, he was released from prison. Some authorities still consider him too dangerous to live in the community and attempted to have him combined on a locked psychiatric ward. State officials noted that he had violent fantasies and planned to carry them out, but he did not meet the legal criteria for involuntary commitment, which required diagnosis of mental illness. Schreiner went home to live with his mother. Gee, I wonder what happened. On May 20th, 89, seven-year-old Ryan Hain was found in Tacoma standing in the woods near his home. He was in shock, naked, Schreiner had raped and choked the child and cut off his penis. Good God. A year after his arrest, in a unanimous vote, legislators passed the Community Protection Act, creating one of the first sex registries in the country. Good. It included a civil commitment law that made it possible to keep offenders like Schreiner confined to a psychiatric ward even after they completed their sentences. Good. Washington became the first state to pass a three strikes law mandating life sentences after a third from conviction for certain felonies. Years later, it was reduced to two strikes for some sex offenders. Good. Over the next decade, a series of new laws and revisions to existing laws significantly reduced the likelihood that sex offenders would qualify for a lighter alternative sentences. At the same time, it expanded the number of sex crimes that could result in a life sentence. Offenders were spending more time in prison, and the number of offenders on the sex, regist sex registry increased. In Florida, sentences are shorter. Peter Aiken, a Florida defense lawyer, has represented 45 men in stings. 23 cases, he was able to get the charges reduced to non-sex offense, like unauthorized use of a computer. His priority is keeping these men off the registry. Once they're on the sex registry, landlords won't run to them. They can't get jobs for all practical purposes. Their lives are ruined. Only a handful of people arrested in Washington State sting cases have been acquitted. Prosecutors have used the criminal code that stemmed from the desire to contain an Earl Schreiner to win long or even life sentences and lifetime registration for men picked up in the net nanny operations. Shrimp, the prosecutor in Tacoma, says that in the cases involving real children, she will sometimes settle for a lesser plea rather than risk further trauma by having them testify. Operation Net Nanny cases are different. The witnesses are all adults, mostly undercover officers. The evidence collect makes it easier for her to take a case to trial and secure a longer sentence. Where we don't have a victim, it allows us to be able to pr prosecute child predators in a different fashion. Good. In 2017, James Davis Wallace of Lopez Island, Washington, pleaded guilty to a second-degree rape of a child for sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl over the course of a year. He also admitted during a psychological assessment to, to molesting two siblings. The judge sentenced him to a minimum of seven and a half years. The same year, Schempf took Kenneth Chapman of Tacoma, a 32-year-old with no previous felony convictions, to trial in a net nanny case. Chapman had been arrested after sending texts about having sex with an 11-year-old uh, to an undercover officer, excuse me, to an undercover officer posing as the girl's mother. And, okay, whoa. Chapman had been arrested after sending texts about having sex with an 11-year-old girl with an 11-year-old to an undercover officer posing as the girl's mother and then driving to the sting house. Okay. What? Okay. That's depraved. This guy thought he was texting an actual woman and arranging to have sex with her child. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not crying tears for this guy Chapman. He deserved to get arrested. He deserved to go to jail for however long it was. While the star prosecution witness, Sergeant Carlos Rodriguez of the Washington State Patrol, had extensive documentation of the text messages, he failed to record the phone calls with Chapman, and a key part of his testimony was contradicted by a fellow trooper. Nevertheless, after deliberating for just a few hours, the jury found Chapman guilty of fir attempted first-degree rape of a child, attempted commercial sex abuse of a minor, and communicating with a minor for immoral purposes. He was sentenced to a minimum of 10 years. Good. Good.
Shrimp declined to comment on the Chapman case, but said a 10-year sentence in these situations is appropriate. I would say it is if you are contacting somebody who you believe to be an adult who is trying to pimp their child out for sex. That, that's just my opinion. She said that the people rounded up in net nanny stings were just as dangerous as the ones charged with assaulting children. I agree. They just hadn't been caught. Is that what this writer would like? Would, would this writer prefer that there be actual child victims? I don't. Children may be afraid to speak up, she said, and when they do, adults don't often believe them. When you look at these, when you look at the criminal history, it really doesn't give a full picture of who these people are. A state Patrol spokesman said in an email that Operation Net Nanny represents the work of serious professionals. Our undercover personnel must pretend to be part of a dangerous, reckless, and uncaring community of sexual exploitation to affect legally grounded, ethically executed, and morally imperative arrests. I agree. Okay, now the rest of this article goes on, it, it, it talks about this group called Our, and I, I, I don't think the writer of the story likes how Our, this group, is helping to fund organizations like the Washington Police to catch these child predators, okay? I think he even, okay, yeah, so we have to, it's the New York Times, we have to have uh, references to bad, evil Sean Hannity, evil Laura, Laura Ingram, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and here we go, Trump. So the guy who's a part of one of these things is, you know, it's the New York Times. What, you, what are you going to do? Uh, okay, let's, let's just keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, they didn't do anything wrong. Retired from, uh, later went to work for our domestic coordinator, continues to advertise. Good, good. I hope this, I, I would recommend everybody uh, contribute to OUR. Let's see. Number of men who got to prison is measurable. Of the 90, 193 anti cases resolved to date, I was able to document 113, 137 ended in guilty pleas. Of the 42 that went to trial, 40 resulted in convictions. If one reason the men take guilty pleas in such cases is to avoid near certain conviction, another is expense. Jace Hamburg's mother spent $50,000 in legal fees, emptying her savings and borrowing from family. Brenda Chapman, whose son Kenneth received a 10-year sentence in 2017, is a manager at Boeing. Wait a minute, was Kenneth Chapman the guy who wanted to have... Yeah, let me go back up. Uh, let, me, let me just make sure. Uh, yeah, Kenneth Chapman was the guy who, who arranged to try to have sex with a child through the, uh, the girl's mother, okay? God. Oh, my God. All right, let's let's keep going. Brenda Chapman, whose son received a 10-year sentence in 2017. Well, most of the men in their families rely on public defenders. She sold her Boeing stock, borrowed from her 401k, and mortgaged her home to hire a trial lawyer, uh, Miles Johnson, whom the judge praised for doing a great job, and a top private appeals court attorney, Jason Saunders. In March 2019, a state appeals court dismissed the two most serious charges on which Chapman had been convicted, writing their opinion that he should have been allowed to argue entrapment. A first for a net nanny case. The judges noted that even though Chapman cut off all contact with the fictional woman proposing an incestuous encounter with her fictional 11-year-old daughter, Rodriguez, who was writing the text, kept going back to trying to lure him. You might not like it, but you know what? He still decided to go. He still made the decision to go. He gets no sympathy for me. Chapman was released after having spent two years in prison, but the county prosecutor's office said it would retry the case good. After nine months of pretrial advocacy from the Chapman's defense team, the prosecuting attorney's officer office reversed its position, agreeing to drop the two most serious charges. The third charge, however, communicating with a minor for a moral purpose, which carried a three-month jail term, stands. Chapman must still register as a sex offender for at least 10 years. Good. To date, Brenda Chapman has spent $160,000 in legal fees. It's her prerogative. Washington State, new inmates carrying processing papers that identify... All right, so this is where... They don't want to admit what they did or else they get killed by their uh, their cellmates. When Hamburg faced the other inmates, he panicked and said he was in arrest for assault one, a mistake. His sentence wasn't long enough for assault one. The other inmates shouted, the other men shouted, suspect, suspect. My cell, he said, is your paperwork clean? Hamburg recalled. He told them that he'd broken a rear bottle over a guy's head and then stabbed him. He said that his sentence wasn't longer because of mitigating circumstances, mentioning his ADHD. The cellmate asked to see the papers. He said, the only people who don't show their papers are murderers and sex offenders. Which one is it? So, Hambrick told the truth, and the cellmate believed his story and let him off, basically. So, Hambrick was able to survive jail. He earned a certificate in carpentry, uh, joined the Toastmasters Club, read voraciously, played lots of Scrabble, made friends, and did not get a single infraction. Well, good. 
All right. When a white nationalist stole his headphones, he kept quiet. His first Christmas in prison, he gave each man on his tier a packet of instant coffee and two fireball candies. Last of all, he finally met his best friend of five years, Simon, who traveled from Indiana to visit him in prison. Hambrick says it was his mother's visits that saved him. That's nice. Blah, 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 blah. I probably gave him blah, 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 blah. My mother was lied to all. That's fine. In January this year, Hambrick was released after serving almost two years, one of the lightest sentences among the 177 convictions that I was able to confirm in these cases. His mom took him to IHOP for his first meal as a free man. She bought him a new fleece coat, and he pulled off the prison sweatshirt, leaving it outside the newspaper box. Should we donate it, she asked. Someone will take it, he said. Sure enough, when they came out for breakfast, out of breakfast, uh, a homeless man was wearing it. This all right, the man asked. That's why it was there, Hambrick said. The next day, he was up well before dawn, uh, on the tiers, the lights came up early for the morning count. The first order of business was checking in with his new parole officer. As a parole sex offender, Hambrick has a long list of restrictions. He couldn't be anywhere children congregated. No malls, no movie theaters, no ball games. He wasn't allowed to walk the family dog in a park. He's not allowed to drink beer even at home. Before beginning romantic relationships, he had to get permission from the parole officer. And before having sex, he's required to for his partner that he is a sex offender. Yike! Each month, he is required to pay a $40 fee to cover the cost of his parole officer's work and up to $200 more for state-mandated counseling. If he follows these rules for the next 10 years, he can apply to be removed from the registry. Hambrick's appointment was for 9 a.m., but he got there for 7.45 to be safe. Good for him. After already he went to the local sheriff's officer to register and be fingerprinted. When it was his turn, he walked through a door with big black letters that read, Sex Offenders, Monday to Friday. Hambrick has appealed his convictions. In March, he enrolled in an online software coding course. Learn to code! After months of looking for work, he is hired for a weekend laborer's job. Other than that, he rarely leaves the house. Aww. Michael Weinrup is a Pulitzer Prize winner. He was a reporter and an editor at the Times for more than 30 years. He has written extensively on the criminal justice system. A version of this article appears in print on August 30th, page 36 of the Sunday Magazine, with the headline, Crime Fiction. Gee, that's <laughs> that headline doesn't indicate the newspaper's point of view on the story. So clearly the New York Times finds that these things uh, are mostly unfair to the poor, innocent child predators that were just minding their own business, going to Craigslist, going to the sex section of Craigslist, striking up a friendship with somebody who then identified themselves as a 13-year-old girl, continuing this conversation over the course of like three hours or so to the point where he decided to buy condoms and go visit this supposed 13 year old girls sorry he's a grown man okay he has to take responsibility i don't know if he has yet he still feels like he was wrong like he was set up no he wasn't set up he did not have to go he did not have to contact that girl the second that girl identified herself as being 13, he should have just not even written another word, just gotten out of there. These stings are very important. Uh, as a father, I cannot imagine what it would be like to learn that my son was a victim uh, of somebody like this. Uh, it seems like the New York Times magazine, or at least this writer, doesn't want us to think of sex crimes against children as being some of the most horrific crimes that people can commit. To me, they are some of the most horrific crimes that people can commit, given the nature of the victim, uh, the helplessness, uh, just physically, they're weak, they can't fight back. Intellectually, they can't fight back. They can't process, they can't consent. And the New York Times Magazine wants us to feel, I don't know, is it empathy or sympathy for these men? I, I don't. They made terrible decisions. They could have avoided these decisions. I don't care if you're pathetic. Look, I'm not. The, Lord knows I, I am not God's gift. But never, ever in a million years would I ever consider e even striking up a conversation. Look, I'm 45. I'm going to be 45 years old next month. I'm single. What do I have? What on earth do I have in common with a 13-year-old girl? Nothing. I don't, have, I don't have anything really in common with, with people half my age. 22-year-old college kids, for God's sake. What do I have in common? All these guys want is sex. They don't want a relationship. They want sex. They want to use these children as objects to fulfill whatever their perverse desires are. And in my opinion, you have to have very strong sentences 
against these people to send a message to those around them that, yes, you could very well ruin your life if you choose to go down this path. Again, nobody's forcing them to. Uh, I would never want to see police put real children in harm's way to try to get some arrests or convictions. It's a good thing that the police can do this. They should continue to do it, and I will support them every step of the way.